The first ambush in Resident Evil 4 Remake feels like being in a dream. I don't mean that in a positive or negative way, but in a very neutral one. I've played this segment in the original so many times, I'm extremely familiar with the layout. So booting up this remake and fumbling around here with different controls, new aiming calibration, stumbling on little elements around the level not present before, it was like one of those dreams where you're in a place you're very familiar with, yet you don't fully have control of your actions because you're asleep and your brain is sort of floating you around your house or hometown. Things just slightly off or uncanny. That's what most of this game feels like, like opening doors and kind of seeing what you expect, but it's like a blurry vision of the past that your brain has made a recreation of out of different reconstituted parts. There's other ways in which this game is kind of dreamlike. I'm gonna come clean with you guys and admit that I play my fair share of video games, and as a result, sometimes I dream about playing games I've played a lot of, but those games will appear in my dreams different, like maybe with extra areas or new character interactions in places or stages there weren't before. And that is also an uncanny feeling brought to the table by RE4 Remake. This might draw a smile on your face in some rooms, but do the opposite when it happens in others. And the question is, do the times where that smile emerges outweigh the times it doesn't? Well, when is it worth remaking a game? I like to ask what the objective is when doing so. With RE2 Remake, you can argue there's an interesting one. To recreate a scenario from a game in 1998 with the mechanical language of a game from 2019, making for two distinct experiences, each with a different take on the same setup, rather than a remake that tries to supplant what came before. The thing about RE2 is that the way third-person action shooter horror games are made changed significantly between 98 and 2019, but not so much between 2005 and 2023. So with RE4R, you get a remake more reminiscent of the first Resident Evil remake for GameCube from 2002. A similar gameplay that tries to differentiate itself with a few iterative mechanical twists, and a similar game layout that wants to surprise you with subtle alterations and occasionally avert ones too. I like Remake 1 a lot, but arguably it's conceptually the kind of remake I'm less a fan of, attempting to update the original rather than creating a wholly new experience that stands alongside it. But that game was made under unique circumstances compared to remakes today. RE1 Remake came out only six years after the original RE, which is less time than it took Capcom to do a special edition of Devil May Cry 4. In the late 90s, Capcom re-released the original with some remixed editions and ports, and you could almost see RE1 Remake in 2002 as a culmination of those updates, with the original director returning to put together the most ambitious rearrangement yet, using resources unavailable when RE was yet to be a proven IP. At this point, RE4 shares a similar history, re-released with extra content in alternate forms until we reach here. Original director notwithstanding, a graphical overhaul with gameplay readjustments and a few new areas and twists. But getting that 18 years after RE4 first came out, as opposed to around just half a decade, is a big difference. Almost two decades later, you're expecting a more revelatory leap like we got with RE2 Remake's fundamental redesign. It's hard to shake that feeling, regardless of the reality that RE4 Remake doesn't have the same new pool of gaming design changes to draw from that RE2 Remake did, largely because the original RE4 invented a lot of them. Either way, I think one of the reasons I am open to the concept of Resident Evil games being remixed and remade, more so than other franchises, regardless of whether it's a big overhaul or just a more subtle remix, is because this has always been a franchise about multiple retellings of the same scenario. The very first moments of the series presents you with a choice between two contradictory campaigns, and still to this day there's no definitive canon account of that original title, every campaign and every re-release having some contradictory element. So a remix of RE4 isn't terribly offensive to me, especially with the original available on every modern platform for players to compare and contrast with. But is it a good remix? I'm not terribly married to the concept of remakes having to stay true 
true to the original, since if I want something true to the original, I'll play the original. What makes RE4 Remake compelling is that while it brings back almost every room from the original title, all of them come with a twist. Sometimes the entire layout is rearranged, and other times it's as simple as changing the way you have to enter or exit an area. Say what you want about RE1 Remake being just a graphical update, but change none of the graphics from the original and add crimson heads and the new sub-bosses and areas, and you have a compelling remix. And for a lot of this game, I felt similarly. You get these great little small original chunks that, divorced from the context of Resi 4, would still be worthy of praise for their new design if you threw them into a Resident Evil level pack or something. 4 Make does suffer in areas where 1 Make doesn't. You can't really argue 1 Make leaves any significant segment out from the original. While as of writing, DLC-less, 4 Make certainly does exclude chunks. It also has some new segments that are indeed worse than what was in the original, and certain moments aiming to create a similar mood are done not quite as well, which I can barely think of an example of in One Make. The addition of the hook weapon and the crawling maneuver is also a bit out of place and a bit silly looking. Hold on a second. How did this footage get in here? Sorry, sorry about this. Graphics are a significant part of this new RE4, so I do have to give my assessment there too, right? Since I like my reviews to be timeless and rewatchable, I'll just get ahead of things in case you're watching this in 2041 or something. All these years after the release of Resident Evil 4 Remake, it looks dated and is in need of an update. It's amazing that we thought this looked good all those years ago in 2023. Making a remake to update the graphics is at the bottom of the list of good reasons to do one. It always seems to come from this place of trying to objectively improve a previous release in some way. And regardless of the new tech available, that might not be the result if the art style or lighting changes to a point where the original intention of an area in the game is altered dramatically. How good a game looks isn't determined by a slider labeled graphics that you raise and the whole game looks better. And like most remakes, Resi 4 Remake has its segments that don't hit quite as hard as they did before, regardless of the raw graphical power now on the table. The Rainy Night segment in the latter half of the village area has probably some of the most evident drop in drip, or increase in drip if we're talking about the size of the raindrops now. The more striking, overt lightning, denser and finer rain, and harsher patches of darkness punctuated by flashes of light just gave this area a more ominous mood in the original. A recent patch while I was writing reduced the raindrop size, and it looks a little better, but the area still doesn't come close to the atmosphere of the first game, and the big raindrops still seem to be present in the cutscenes. On the subject of water, I was kind of distracted too by the kind of low frame rate looking water in the Del Lago fight. There's an argument to be made here that the fight looks nicer with the peachy sunset colors in contrast to the brown, almost monochromatic look of the original. But I think the original works better because it looks like a lake I don't want to be on. It looks oppressive and nasty and less like a Sunday getaway out to nature. On the flip side, there are of course areas that marvel with their detailed clutter. Rooms with astonishing attention to detail that fly by. Clothing looks insanely detailed, and for the most part, the characters wearing them look really good too. Except maybe for Stretch Armstrong over here, who looks a bit rubbery. And there are definitely some boss fights that impress with the scale and complexity of their new designs. The visuals overall are solid. None of it is gonna look like quite as much of a shocking transformation as RE2 Remake, since it's the first six the gen resi to be remade rather than a fifth one, but polish is evident. What undercuts a lot of moments in the game though is just how they're directed and designed regardless of the visual polish. The swamp fight in the original I thought was cool because it gave you the choice between taking the high road and the low road, and as you made your way across you could switch between them at different points strategically. Now the area is more of a maze that directs you up and down on its own terms. The Mendez fight is arguably more fair, the barn is larger, it's easier to tell when he's attacking, and he stays at one side of the arena for the second phase, allowing you to keep track of him easily. But with the fog removed and more room to maneuver, the fight loses a lot of its original intensity. And before you were trapped in this cramped space with an unpredictable monster who would dip around all over the place chaotically. The camera system never quite allowing you to keep track of him at all times. Now the edges are sanded off and it's less intense, less memorable. 
The Regenerator's introduction also felt kind of botched to me. You're introduced to them with a glimpse of one running down the hallway, which almost felt a bit comedic, like he didn't know you were already here and is rushing back to his room to get ready. The original played with the distance of the camera to create this claustrophobic atmosphere that then bubbled over with the monster's first appearance. The cat and mouse chase with the Verdugo is a little less threatening, partly because the environment feels a lot less musty and dingy. It's much brighter with them trying to give the area a more overtly white, icy aesthetic, and it lacks the unsettling effect of the flickering light. But also because Leon keeps dropping one-liners here this time, which made me feel a lot more at ease. We're playing hide and seek, is that it? He's too much of a reassuring presence for the level's own good, if you can hear him the way the sound is balanced by default. On the subject of sound, I actually think most of the new battle music goes harder than the original and is pretty cool. Though on the flip side, the more ambient music is less effective. There are these more subdued kind of homage tracks to the original ambient themes that might tickle your nostalgia, but aren't very memorable in their own right. Maybe they just want to tickle your nostalgia with a few iconic strings, so you'll buy the original soundtrack swap DLC. Eh. There are of course segments here handled arguably better than last time. Like the Krauser fight now being a more involved bit of gameplay, and the Ashley segment being longer and more thought out. But the bits that really shone were the segments that used pieces of past areas from the original to put together brand new puzzle-like battle arenas, devilish encounters. I really liked this tricky one, where an enemy that can mutate the other enemies and send out stun waves sits at the end of a corridor connected to the battle arena. Head down that hallway too thoughtlessly though, and you run the risk of being trapped by enemies following you. So you have to make the call of whether to tough it out and take everyone down before assaulting this buffer or risk going in early. This segment and many others still have workarounds you can exploit to bypass a chunk of the challenge if you come with the right resources. And I'm not against that. It's an element that both versions of RE4 have that call back to the survival gameplay horror roots of the series when the franchise was more about planning for a battle or scenario rather than your dexterity when dealing with enemies. And and even if you figure out a workaround, it's still up to you to ration the resources that will let you put cheeky strategies into practice throughout the title. When and where to get cheeky to prolong the cheekiness effectively. As cool as some of the redesigned levels are, again though there are new areas that aren't a hit. Probably the tackiest part of the game is the new segment on the castle battlements, where a gigante in the background will chuck rocks at you. It's like you do this little level with some simple door puzzles, while periodically rocks fly at you. I suppose it's trying to inflate the scope of this segment, where a guy on a turret would give you grief while you tried to get around the area. The issue is, the scenario really undercuts the threat of the gigante. This monster is striking because they just drop this giant guy in a room with you to fight. But this one hides on the other side of a chasm, chucking debris at you. Bit underwhelming. And then there's this lame jump scare as you leave the level. Doesn't amount to anything. I guess I'm just saying, when one makes new segments feature stuff like the incredibly unsettling Lisa Trevor subplot, and in Resi 4 Remake we get Rock Gigante, it's a bit disappointing. The design of the overall map has shifted slightly. While you'll still tackle most levels, or rather their remixed iterations in the same order, they've been arranged differently in closer clusters to allow for easier backtracking. The Del Lago River now can next to more areas so you can return to older segments to unlock treasures or whatnot. This rearrangement also lets the player dip back around for side quests. Some are a bit gimmicky, but ultimately harmless, while others are really cool extra tasks, like additional tough enemy encounters you can risk resources in for greater rewards. How are the core fundamentals of play different though? Well, you can move now while aiming and shooting, and to compensate, enemies seem more aggressive, so the difficulty largely balances out. But the way the game evokes tension has changed, and whether or not that tension is as consistently thick is up for debate. You used to have two options, stand and attack or reposition. Now there's a third option, wriggle around and try and get some extra hits in while your view wobbles about, making your aim less precise and your shots harder to line up. 
How impacted your aiming will be by moving does depend a bit on the weapon. There's a tremendous drop in accuracy trying to move and shoot with pistols or rifles, but there are less downsides to be on the go while shooting with the spread offered by the shotgun. You could argue things used to be more simplistic and now having the extra option to move a tiny bit while being less accurate just provides another interesting choice to consider in the heat of the moment. But the original do or dip binary provided a tension and thrill that never went away because it couldn't be undermined by getting better at wobbly aiming while moving, or by getting a weapon with larger spread out that lent itself well to run and gun. It really made you think about the space you were in, and was deliberately tailored to a game where most of your enemies were descending on you with melee attacks from different angles. Really though, it's not moving and shooting that makes the biggest difference, but moving and reloading, which wasn't possible in the original. Taking a risk in the original, standing your ground and reloading to take out enemies in front of you, was seriously tempting, because retreating to reload really meant taking your eye off the ball to find a safe space to stand still and do it. Now it almost always makes sense to retreat, since you can reload mid-reposition while angling the camera to keep an eye on the enemy. It's not like moving and shooting where your aim is going to be impacted while doing it. Leon isn't going to reload less effectively when doing it on the move, so the choice becomes, I'd argue, less interesting and difficult in this case. Maybe all the stuff you can now do while moving encouraged the elimination of the skylift. Now being on the move while trying to hit targets isn't such a novelty of a scenario. Moving and shooting also means that it doesn't feel as much of a loss for the minecart segment to be more of a set piece that restricts your weapon choice. One could make the argument that as graphics become less abstract, concepts like not being able to move while shooting start to create dissonance between the mechanics and the otherwise realistic looking world you're in. But that argument is hard to justify when games like RE4 Remake still have plenty of concessions that fly in the face of realism, where a character may not be able to escape a circumstance because the game has decided something they could climb over isn't an option. Why does Leon need Ashley to climb a high area? Surely he could figure something out, move a box over there. Could Leon and Luis not have worked together to boost each other up here? Could they not have shimmied along the side of this wooden banister to get across this gap? Not to mention there's plenty of concessions that forego realism made for the sake of convenience, like Leon not having to bend over to pick up items. Or, you know, just getting to have an inventory in a different dimension rather than carrying it all around on his model. Maybe in 2041 the realism argument will fly, but until then, it's worth pointing out the downside of moving away from classic RE movement in the context of RE4's gameplay. Though I suppose how much you like the new movement style will depend on your outlook. In terms of games as a whole, the new movement isn't as uncommon as the originals, but it is unique to RE4, it's different to experience RE4 with it. An easy one, of course, was the inclusion of on-the-fly weapon switching. That would have been great in the original, and it's great here. I also always envisioned a version of RE4 where you could store weapons away and pick them up later. And Remake lets you do that by allowing you to leave weapons behind at typewriters and pick them up at the next one. It's not exactly how I saw it playing out, though. I I always thought they could have contextualized that by maybe letting you hand weapons over to the merchant to store for you. Maybe for a small fee to carry out the deposit, which could have made for some decision making absent here with the free to use typewriter weapon storage system. Stealth is now another tool on the table. Leon can creep around and do takedowns, giving him an advantage in rooms with hordes that haven't detected him yet. A lot of areas heavily hint towards you giving this option a try, though you never have to do it. It feels half baked, of course, but I guess it doesn't hurt things by being an option when starting on the next area. What I'm not a big fan of is how the game handles context sensitive animations or attacks like the ones involved in the stealth gameplay. To be clear, Resi 4 has always had these in some form, like the kick you can only do when enemies are stunned and you get the prompt. But in both versions of the game this is fine because the prompt is the X button, which you can run in and smash confidently to trigger the kick because the only thing X is going to do otherwise is maybe teleport an item into your inventory if you walk over it. But mistime a context dependent stab animation and prepare to swipe off target. It's not that you shouldn't have to time these things, it's just that if you miss the timing, it sucks to perform an action you never intended on doing. Triggering the special stabs can also be frustrating when the criteria for when they're available gets so mysterious and you're standing around waiting for the game to deem it an action Leon is allowed to do. Knives that degrade based on the level of stress you're putting them under is a cool idea. It's an evolution of the defense items from the original remake and expands the use of the knife from RE4 Classic in a natural way. 
Upgrading it from a niche way to deflect incoming objects to full-on parry machine. While Resi 3's counters were based around reflexes and timing, and One Make's counters were based around resource management, here both reflexes and resources come into play together for a fair and satisfying system. The only issue you can end up with is no way to fight if all your knives break, which in a few niche scenarios certainly was a ball ache. Gunpowder combos aren't a bad inclusion. Use a bit for handgun ammo or wait for more so you can craft stronger ammo or just ammo for guns you like better. It means that even though enemies are still dropping resources like candy, throwing gunpowder into that mix of drops compounds that pickup with extra choices. Speaking of gunpowder, you still can't buy ammo from the merchant, but you can buy scrap, which you can combine with gunpowder to make some ammo of your choice. The game doesn't let you buy ammo outright, but it does let you steer your resources towards the kind of ammo you'd want, which is a pretty great middle ground. I guess technically you can buy a tiny bit of ammo from the merchant per playthrough because he does stock a very small amount of gunpowder for a hefty price, but despite that tiny pool of gunpowder available, the game is actually still stingier about the amount of ammo you can directly get from the merchant than the original, now that upgrading a weapon's ammo capacity doesn't refill the gun. The Resi 4 attaché case is back, but now you can hit a button to auto-sort it. So on my first playthrough, I only had to play Inventory Tetris like twice to try and make some extra room. It was playing that game of trying to maximize the efficiency of the inventory that incentivized me in the original to want to organize things neatly and take ownership of the inventory. Now I couldn't care less and just let the computer decide for me because what good does it do for me to organize things in an orderly, personalized way that expedites picking stuff up when the game will figure it out for me. Most of my weapon selecting is in real time from the D-pad menu, so I don't even really have to know where my weapons are in the inventory to select them quickly anyway. It's kind of weird playing RE4 without that pillar that is the inventory management. Though I wouldn't enjoy being in this menu much no matter what the case were, because they've managed to suck all the character out of the UI of this game. The menus in the original RE4 had way more character, dirty, rusty, reflecting the game's environment with your clean military kit contrasting that aesthetic. Hey, just kind of like how Leon's clean, orderly tactical gear contrasts the environment he's in. Now the UI has this cold, clean, empty, minimalist look which doesn't suit the game. And even judged on those terms, it really lacks a sense of style. Ending a chapter used to have this unhinged, jittery text matching the crazy, macabre events unfolding, and cool blocks of writing on top of a bright, washed-out picture that made it look like some weird old case file being displayed on a projector. Skip over to the remake, and in between chapters I'm half expecting Ghost from Call of Duty to let me know we'll get him next time. When you're protecting Ashley, you can now ask her to stay close to you or follow from further away. Which is nice, but I was kind of missing the ability to tell her to just stay put. A lot of changes are kind of lateral. Usually you're trading one thing for another. Tension is lost with movement changes, but you technically get more options in combat. On-the-fly weapon switching is convenient, but now there's less reason to engage with inventory management. Some levels are improved, while others are worse. Either way, you're still getting the core gameplay appeal of Resi 4, just with added twists. It's still a game about tense situations, where you're ganged up on by enemies that do incredible damage, and have to make split-second decisions about who is the priority target, and which out of a huge list of tools and resources is best to use in that split second. Take out the right enemy whose drop can be reached, and that could lead to resources that change the entire tide of the battle. Pick poorly and you can sink yourself in seconds. It's still a thrilling system. Some changes serve to make it more interesting, while also creating imperfections that didn't exist before. Something that I think was done better overall, though, was the story. Infamously, the original RE4 during development went through various iterations, all trying to tie the game's premise into the tangled lore that had been conjured up by the various games and remakes after 3, until eventually they just went, whatever, and slapped together a script in a few weeks that had nothing to do with all of that. What you get is a series of scenes depicting random chaos that loosely linked the game's set pieces together, with nothing much to get invested in beyond cheesy lines and cool poses. The rest of the title was such a great action game that it's easy to overlook that and not care, but come on, if Resi 4 had landed with a super involving story that made us all cheer and cry, I don't think anybody would be asking for them to have made it dumber. No matter the voice or cutscene direction, the way the gameplay and plot intertwine 
actually gets you involved in the rivalry with Nemesis in 3, making the resolution exciting and impactful. There's nothing like that in the original 4. Even Leon's worst first day ever as a policeman in RE2 made for a more compelling character than the guy we got in 4. 4 Remake doesn't exactly make RE4 a gripping tale for the ages, but it did actually wrangle something close to an emotion out of me at one point, and that was surprising. Like I said, I'm not terribly married to the objective of trying to stay true to the original. I'd rather have something different that stands alone, especially when we're dealing with RE4, the original version of which you can play on almost anything. So I was up for them changing the direction of Resi 4's story, maybe trying to make it more serious and less over the top and silly at points. Something fitting for the harrowing scenario the game actually is about, especially if we're going to try and up the fidelity of the graphics and redo all the dialogue. The game is made a little more serious, but not by a whole lot. Instead, they go for more of a middle ground. Pretty much every crazy scenario from the original returns, with a couple of exceptions that get recontextualized. Just to try and give the game a more realistic garnish, the game is prone to lampshading the situation with dialogue. Leon, are you kidding me? Jumping across chandeliers, seriously, who does that? Hidden platform? A little over the top, don't you think? It probably is the perfect middle ground if the attempt is to keep the events of the original while making this more palatable to newer audiences. Yeah! Come on, you can't be serious. But I think they could have gotten a bit bolder with things. Lean more into the horror, even if it is at the cost of some classic meme moment from the original. Anyway, we're going to be getting into spoilers now, so skip ahead if you want. To make the events of the game feel a little less random, certain bits and pieces are moved around. Luis exits the story later, and Krauser confronts Leon a little earlier. In fact, the two characters now overlap, making both stories feel a little less disconnected. Luis's story is the one that undergoes the biggest update, which I think is pretty calculated, since he was such a fun, cheeky character, yet felt fairly underutilized in the original. Now he doesn't just team up with Leon in the cabin, but has a whole co-op segment in the mines, giving us more time to delve into his character and motivations. He was a researcher for Umbrella and Los Illuminados, and wants to help remove the plaga Leon and Ashley are infected with to help alleviate his conscience, balance the scales a little after contributing to evil. He still dies, but his death is made much more poignant by fleshing out these details. In his final moments, he passes on the key to his lab so Leon can use a machine there to remove the parasites that threaten to make him a walking bug host like the enemies in the game. As you continue through the game, it's easy to glaze over this key in your menu as you deal with other more pressing issues. But then, in a new far more dramatic sequence, Leon is struggling to hold back the effects of the parasite as he approaches Luis's lab. The whole world is distorting around him, and then just as things start looking hopeless, we snap back to reality as Leon summons up one last bit of lucidity. Reflecting this sudden burst of clarity, the game cuts to its no-frills use item screen. And suddenly, that one key you had almost forgotten about reveals itself as the most important key item in the game, named simply Luis's key. It feels like the character is opening that door with you in spirit, which is so simple, but got me a little choked up. And 20 years after the original game, it felt kind of like we were finally giving the character some credit for being so helpful to Leon and Ashley, who even back in 2005 wouldn't have escaped the game alive without his machine. It also makes more sense that Luis's cure machine was hidden behind a bunch of boxes and a locked door, rather than just being easily accessible. It's a little more credible now that Sadler wouldn't have known about it and didn't just destroy the machine. Putting more hurdles between Leon and the cure that Luis directly helps you overcome gives his death more meaning. All he could do to counteract the evil deeds he contributed to was to save the life of two people. But in doing so, he saved the one guy who brought the entire evil empire he helped build to its knees. It's a nice little story because it shows that even if you contribute to some evil stuff, one seemingly smaller good deed can still spiral into much greater positive outcomes. Unfortunately, the stories for the other characters don't quite get the upgrade Luis's does. Leon has a tiny bit more going on. There's this idea presented that while on the surface he's losing his optimism and becoming more nihilistic, that deep inside he's still just that guy who did everything he could to help on his first day at work as a policeman in the worst circumstances possible. That part of him resurfaces again as his instincts take over in this 
this new dire situation. It's not a lot, but it's a nice bit of characterization for Leon that helps thread the needle from two to four better and makes him more likable beyond just his cheesy one-liners. Ashley's story remains pretty similar. She gets more dialogue that helps develop her relationship with Leon. She has a little more personality and the game highlights her increased confidence as we rattle through her various achievements. Despite still being out of her depth, it feels like she's going through a little arc of her own. Krause's reasons for betraying Leon are given a little more texture, but he's still as ridiculous an inclusion as ever, and if anything, going into his megalomaniacal motivations rather than keeping it more secret, only helps him come off more ridiculous. His backstory, as is stated here, seems to conflict with the backstory as it was presented in Dark Side Chronicles, which to be honest, I don't have a big problem with. If there's one thing that honestly makes it easier to take the story of these Resident Evil games more seriously when playing this new remake saga, is how they wipe away or blur out all the weird, crazy shit from the spin-off titles. If we're gonna expand on character stories more, I don't see why we couldn't have had more going on with The Merchant even. He just kind of remains aloof and does his one-liners. I get that he's supposed to be enigmatic, I'm not suggesting we reveal his name and origin, but if the Duke in RE8 can be just as enigmatic, with a little bit of added involvement in the story, and a bit more of a relationship with the lead, I don't see why the merchant couldn't have had something similar going on. It's kind of strange how much new content Luis gets, yet Ada in contrast receives so little. There isn't much of an expansion of her story, and given that Leon and Ada are supposed to have this unique connection throughout the series, you'd think they would have done more to build up that relationship even more than the original did. Maybe even with a new co-op segment. They pull back on her character so much, I have to assume stuff like this is being saved for a separate ways DLC, so we'll have to see. Sadler gets a little more development. It's implied that he has deeper convictions in his wild beliefs this time, as opposed to just being power mad. But also his ancestors were exiled from the village years ago, making you second guess if maybe there's more resentment at play than ideology. A little more background doesn't change that he's just still too aloof throughout the game, and doesn't come off as much more than a pompous guy in a robe the few times you actually interact with him. Hard to say he's a very compelling villain still. It's good that Leon and Ashley being infected plays a larger role in the story, though it still feels somewhat underutilized throughout the game, given how big of a plot point it's supposed to be. It could have been cool to see the castle maybe splinter off into a level that made use of some of the alluring development concepts for the original game, where Leon being infected seemed to play a much larger role during regular gameplay. Instead, you get this one hallway as an homage. Okay then. One cutscene I like significantly less than in the original is when Leon gets chucked into this hole. In the original, he survives the fall because he proactively makes a move to survive it. Well, here he just happens to get lucky that a chain is hanging down there. This single chain saved the world. Now we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe. Leon still has that grapple hook. He just didn't feel the need to use it this time because the chain happened to be there. Maybe they thought Leon having a secret grapple hook in his belt was a bit silly, but the character's survival ability takes a real knock now. You also get a lot more history in regards to the village. The family background of Luis, Mendez, Salazar. What could have been interesting would have been to maybe delve into some Spanish history to complement the story. A history that would probably have had a significant effect on a rural Spanish community before something like Los Illuminados arrived. But the game for the most part almost entirely detaches itself from real world Spanish law, which I guess is territory that might have been considered not appropriate for a game like Resi 4. But still, it leaves the setting feeling not just underutilized, but a bit sterile and surface level. That said, Cervantes gets his shout out. Let us rescue the Princess Dulcinea. You gotta hurt yourself. In terms of surface details in the setting though, there are big improvements coming off the original game, such as the villagers no longer having South American accents. And even some nice touches to enemy dialogue. Enemies will now talk in terms of plural if you're with a companion. Which is a cool touch for a foreign tongue in a game's background. The title overall is chucked full of little dialogue details that can crop up depending on behavior 
and little animations and fun quirks. It's not lazily put together. It has that added layer of thought that separate good games from great ones. This all said, seeing the game get so many 10 out of 10s from critics doesn't entirely compute with me. I guess it depends on how you measure what a 10 means, but in my mind, if RE4 Remake is a 10, what does that make the original RE4 a 14? I'm not too cool to admit that when I first played the original RE4, it felt like playing something totally unique and different to what had been coming out. An action game that, in a sea of titles at the time, trying to decide how to handle shooting from a third-person perspective, did it in such a confident and smart way that would go on to be defining in the industry. And that's not what you're going to be feeling playing RE4 Remake for the first time. Some of the highest rated games in 2023 are remakes or remasters, and while it is reassuring that games like Metroid Prime can be re-released so many years later in some form and still be loved by old and new players, what is the Metroid Prime or Resident Evil 4 of this era? In terms of action, adventure, shooter, horror things, the last title to really really make me have a similar feeling of, oh wow, this is something else, was Half-Life Alex, And that was three years ago now. I'm not saying I'm trying every game, but I sympathize with anyone worried that the top of the critical pedestal is just dominated by such a rehash of culture. Dead Space Remake and RE4 Remake have my PS5 sounding so grim right now too. I boot it up and it's like, then I move over and it's like, and I'm sure when Silent Hill 2 Remake comes out, it will also have a splash screen. The only difference is it won't be on my PlayStation. RE4 Remake is like a pleasant dream of the past. It's good, and I think qualifies as a worthwhile alternate take on RE4 for those looking for a remix. But a nice dream of the past shouldn't be better than living the present. Hopefully, as we go forward into that present, dreaming of the past won't be all we have.